Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, it's so good. Love it. Um, I just want to say a few words about uh, the verdict, the Brittany Griner verdict. So today's sentencing is a reminder of what the world already knew. Russia is wrongfully detaining Brittany. She never should have had to endure a trial in the first place. We have repeatedly called for Russia to release her immediately so she can be with her wife, loved ones, friends, and teammates. Under President Biden's direction, the U.S. government continues to work aggressively, pursuing every avenue to bring home Brittany, Paul Whelan, and every American held hostage and wrongfully detained around the world. As you all know, we have made a substantial offer to bring her and Paul Whelan home. We urge Russia to accept that proposal. I'm not able to share more publicly at this time, but we are willing to take every step necessary to bring home our people, as we demonstrated with Trevor Reed. And that's what we're going to do here. I can assure you, this is something the President and our national security team are focused on every single day. The President receives regular updates about the status of our negotiations to secure Brittany's release, as well as the release of Paul Whelan and other U.S. nationals who are wrongfully detained or held hostage in Russia and around the world. So we will continue, or we'll, we'll continue to, to focus on getting our U.S. nationals um, home. So additionally, as you have, you might seen, you have might seen, the People's Republic of China launched 11 ballistic missiles towards Taiwan. Uh, to speak on this and other foreign policy news of the day, National Security Coordinator for Strategic Communications, John Kirby, is here to join with join me today, and uh, he'll take over and take your questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. As uh, Kareen alluded, and I'm sure all of you have covered, overnight, People's Republic of China launched an estimated 11 ballistic missiles towards Taiwan which impacted to the northeast, the east, and southeast of the island. We condemn these actions, which are irresponsible and at odds with our longstanding goal of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and in the region. China has chosen to overreact and use the speaker's visit as a pretext to increase provocative military activity in and around the Taiwan Strait. We anticipated that China might take steps like this. In fact, I described them for you in quite some detail just the other day, Monday. We also expect that these actions will continue and that the Chinese will continue to react in coming days. The United States is prepared for what Beijing chooses to do. We will not seek, nor do we want, a crisis. At the same time, we will not be deterred from operating in the seas and the skies of the Western Pacific consistent with international law, as we have for decades, supporting Taiwan and defending a free and open Indo-Pacific. To that end, Secretary Austin today has directed that the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan and the ships in her strike group will remain on station in the general area to monitor the situation. We will conduct standard air and maritime transits through the Taiwan Strait in the next few weeks consistent, again, with our long-standing approach to defending freedom of the seas and international law. And we will take further steps to demonstrate our commitment to the security of our allies in the region, and that includes Japan. Beijing's actions are of concern to Taiwan, to us, to partners around the world. You probably saw the G7 yesterday rejected Beijing's attempt to coerce and intimidate Taiwan which is a leading democracy. The nations of ASEAN also released a statement overnight about the importance of de-escalating tensions in the Taiwan Strait. And today, the Japanese government reported that five PRC missiles landed in their exclusive economic zone, noting their grave concern, another example 
of how China's actions are undermining peace and security in the region. And we're going to continue to communicate, communicate closely with our partners around the world, which we have demonstrated over and over again is a strength of this administration. Beijing's provocative actions are a significant escalation in its long-standing attempt to change the status quo. As just one example, over the past two years, the PRC has more than doubled the number of aircraft that they have flown over the center line that separates China and Taiwan as compared to the, to the time period between 2016 and 2020. And Beijing has pursued economic coercion, political interference, and cyber attacks against Taiwan, all of which erode the cross-strait status quo. The United States will be resolute, but also steady and responsible. We do not believe it is in our interest, Taiwan's interest, the region's interest, to allow tensions to escalate further, which is why a long-planned Minuteman III ICBM test scheduled for this week has been rescheduled for the near future. As China engages in destabilizing military exercises around Taiwan, the United States is demonstrating instead the behavior of a responsible nuclear power by reducing the risks of miscalculation and misperception. We will continue to demonstrate transparency in our U.S. ballistic missile test through timely notifications. That's a practice that China has often rejected. Rescheduling this test will not in any way, not in any way, impact the modernization, the readiness, or the reliability of America's safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. And the test will happen. It will be rescheduled for the near future. I want to reiterate, as I've been saying all week, nothing, nothing has changed about our One China policy, which is guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint U.S. PRC communiques and the six assurances. And we say it that way every time because it's exactly consistent. And we said that we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. We've also said we do not support Taiwan independence and that we expect cross-strait differences to be resolved by peaceful means. We're also maintaining communication with Beijing. As President Biden told President Xi, the Speaker's visit was consistent with our One China policy, that she had a right to visit, and that a previous Speaker of the House has also visited Taiwan before without incident. This is how we're going to defend America's national security interests and our values, and that is how President Biden directed us to operate in the days ahead, with consistency and clarity and transparency. We'll keep doing that, what we're doing, and we're going to keep supporting cross-strait peace and stability because it matters not just in the Strait, not just to Taiwan, but to the entire region. With that, I'll take some questions. Thanks, uh, John. A couple of questions about uh, Brittany Griner's sentence. First off, why do you believe the Russian judge chose a nine-year sentence for what appears to be a very minor infraction? I certainly can't get inside the head of a Russian judge. Um, what we, we have seen similar m maximal, maximum sentences for drug charges of foreigners in Russia. They typically, it's just historically speaking, foreigners that are arrested on drug charges and then convicted uh, under their system tend to get much higher sentences than would be uh, Russian citizens, but I honestly can't speak to it. I will tell you that, uh, as Corrine rightly said, she shouldn't have even been on trial. She's wrongfully detained. Uh, absent that, uh, we, we find the, the sentence reprehensible in its, in its scope. Um, you know, you've, uh, some details of the U.S. Uh, prisoner swap offer have obviously been public. Do you think the Russians would ever accept a prisoner swap that wasn't one for one or two for two, two of our prisoners for two of theirs? That's a better question for the Russians. What I can tell you is that we put forth a serious proposal. And I, I know everybody is making some assumptions here about what that proposal is. I won't go into detail uh, about it. Um, but it's a serious proposal. We urge them to accept it. They, they should have accepted it weeks ago when we first made it. Why did you make the details of that offer or the fact that you made an offer yeah. public? Doesn't that encourage Russia or really yeah. any bad actor to 
um, take more Americans prisoner, thinking the Americans are going to be willing to deal. Yeah, Tyler asked me that same question, uh, I guess, a week or so ago. Uh, we didn't make it public. We didn't make the decision to make it public lightly. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that you typically do. But what was happening in her case uh, a week ago, what wasn't happening in our negotiations a week ago, um, and in the context of, of her having to to testify in her own defense at a sham trial, um, all of that played into our decision to uh, to at least make public the fact that there was a proposal. It was in uh, it was an earnest attempt to see if we could get to some outcomes here, um, and we're still gonna we're still gonna keep making those attempts. Thank you so much. Um, you had called a counter offer by Russia unserious, um, which involved their offer that the U.S. release a, a convicted Russian national who's being held um, right. in Germany convicted of murder. Is it still an unserious offer? Are you giving it another look in light of the sentence? Nothing's changed about our uh, position on that, uh, on that, uh, uh, on that, on that topic. I mean, I. I don't think we'd go so far as to even call it a counteroffer. Um, President Biden said today, um, in response, my administration will continue to work tirelessly and pursue every possible avenue to bring Brittany and Paul Wheelan home safely as soon as possible. Does, is that a suggestion that he's willing to go even further? Is there more that the U.S. can do to, to pressure Russia to accept this offer? I think Kareem covered it really well in her opening statement. I mean, the president's laser focused on this, and he he, he and the whole team are, are working this literally every day. Um, and just like I won't get into the details of the proposal that uh, that we put forward, I, I don't think it would be helpful to Brittany or to Paul for us to to talk more publicly uh, about um, about where we are in the talks and uh, and what the president might or might not be willing to do. I just want to, again, reiterate what Kareem said. It, he wants to see Brittany and Paul home, and he's personally involved in, in seeing to, to making sure that that outcome happens. And, and very quickly, has the president spoken to Brittany Griner's family? Um, does he plan to do so? I, I don't have any uh, recent, in, like, in terms of, like, the last couple of days, I don't have any Not conversation. The the Not in the wake of the sentencing. Okay. Not, no. And just very quickly, um, on China, given what China's actions that you talked about at the top, does the administration believe it was a mistake for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi? To we have time? said we have said consistently that the speaker had a right to go, um, as Speaker of the House and a member of Congress. She she had a right to go, uh, and uh, I know we're all focused on the stop in Taiwan. And I and, and certainly given the events of the last 12, 18 hours, I, understandably so. But she's not just going to Taiwan. I mean, she's she's moved on now to, to visits in, in Japan and South Korea, two treaty allies. Japan, in particular, uh, deeply concerned about what's going on. Um, and we'll let the speaker talk about her travels and what she's learned, what she's heard, what what her takeaways are. I, I won't I won't talk for her. Members of Congress have every right to travel overseas, uh, and and that includes Taiwan. And they have both both from both parties have just, just this year. And she's, yes, she's the Speaker of the House, but she's also a member of Congress. She has the right to go, and our job was to make sure that she had a safe and secure visit. We did that. We're still in touch with her staff. We're still responsible for making sure the rest of her trip is safe and secure. We'll let her talk about it when she gets back. Thanks, John. Um, on Greiner, I know you said you can't get into too many details here, but can you say if there are non-prisoner concessions on the table at all that you would be willing to consider? I'm not going to get into any more detail. And then on China, um, is the president considering another call with President Xi at all, given how these these escalating uh, tensions? I, I don't have any call on the uh, schedule to to talk to or to announce. Is that being considered at all? Uh, I'm I'm not going to get ahead of the president's uh, schedule. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, the the lines of communication with China are still open at different levels, of course, um, but I, I won't get ahead of the president's schedule. Just Thank you, uh, and thanks so much, John. So you've explained what the U.S. is trying to do in terms of uh, sending out military, uh, military, the USS Reagan, to the region to ensure, I assume... She was already in the region, yeah, but... Understood. Okay, so that, I assume that's also part of uh, keeping shipping routes and um, open and safe 
Uh, I understand that the Taiwanese president is also saying that she's in contact with U.S. allies to ensure that airports and seaports remain, remain open. Is that also part of the, uh, what the administration is trying to do here? And, and the other thing is, just to touch on, on the kinds of communications that you're having with the Chinese government, do you believe that at this point there is a diplomatic off-ramp for, uh, for this crisis? Well, we certainly would like to see the tensions de-escalate. Um, and if that's best done through uh, diplomacy, um, the United States would f fully support that. Uh, we we want to see the tensions come down. I would submit to you that they could come down very easily by just having the, the Chinese stop these, uh, th these very aggressive military drills and flying missiles uh, in and around the Taiwan Strait. You don't need diplomacy to just simply stop doing something that's uh, that's escalating the tensions and putting uh, peace and security in, in the region at risk. Uh, look, the Ronald Reagan and uh, her escort ships, very capable uh, strike group. Uh, they're there to monitor the situation. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be uh, there for a, a little bit longer than they were originally planned uh, to be to be there. Um, again, I won't get ahead of the ship's schedule, but um, the president believed uh, that uh, that it was the prudent thing to do to. To, to, to leave her and her escort ships there just a little bit longer. Is there any kind of support that the U.S. is providing to Taiwan in terms of protecting uh, it in the context of cyber security attacks? Uh, I think that's also something that the Taiwanese are concerned about. Yeah, look, I, 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 for, for lots of good reasons, uh, uh, we don't talk about um, steps we take either unilaterally or bilaterally in, in cyberspace. Um, we are committed, as we have been now for decades, to Taiwan's self-defense. I'll leave it at that. Give us a sense of what Biden's sentencing may mean for negotiations. Her Russian lawyer had said that a deal wouldn't be possible until after she was convicted and sentenced. So now that that's happened, is it more likely, you think, that we may see them willing to negotiate? Essentially, does a conviction open new doors for negotiation? That's really up to the Russian side. Uh, we're still we're, we're still open to having our proposal seriously and positively considered. And um, uh, if on the Russian side that means that they feel like they're more empowered to do that, then so be it. We want them to take the offer that's on the table because it's a good one, it's a fair one, um, and it'll help bring Paul and Brittany home. And if uh, and if if this is what's gonna it's gonna take to get them to, to yes, then then okay, let's get to yes, let's get them home. And it has been now almost a week since Secretary Blinken and Lavrov spoke over the phone. Have you gotten any serious signs from Russia that they're willing to negotiate? Is there any glimmer of progress since then in the last week? I, I'm not going to negotiate in public. Uh, 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 conversations are ongoing at various levels, and I'll just leave it at that. And just to, to follow up on Nancy's question, what message do you think the Russians are trying to send to the U.S. by giving Brittany Griner so severe a sentence? Again, I can't speak for the Russian judge, um, and um, and your question presupposes that it's a message-sending exercise. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. As I said, the, historically, historically, what we've seen is uh, uh, foreign-born citizens uh, that are arrested and convicted of drug charges tend to get, just historically, anecdotally speaking, tend to get higher sentences, almost to the max, which in many cases is 10 years uh, in Russia, as opposed to Russian-born citizens of, of the country uh, convicted uh, of the same offense. It's just, it, it tends to be the case there. So I honestly, I just, I wish I could get inside the judge's head. I can't do it. Um, so I can't define why he chose nine years. As I said to Nancy, it's a reprehensible sentence. She shouldn't have been on the, uh, on trial to begin with. Um, but. That, and that, again, that's why we, I think that's why you saw the president come out so strongly uh, against this, uh, this sham trial to begin with. But to be clear, you, do you think she's being used as a political pawn here? Uh, we think that Brittany and Paul Whelan are being wrongfully detained. They are being wrongfully detained. They need to, to be let go. They need to come home. We're going to keep working on that. I, I cannot ascribe Russian motives or intent here. I just, I, I just, it, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to try to speculate what's in their heads. All I can do is tell you where President Biden is and the national security team. Ron Fleetane, need to come home. There's a deal on the table. Let's make the deal. Let's get him home. I'll come back there to Peter, and then, Thank and then I'll come back. Thanks, John. Why is it that over the last couple of months, President Biden has been so much tougher on Russia than he is on China? wouldn't agree with the premise of the question, uh, Peter. Uh, 
Well, I think just it, when Russia was getting aggressive around Ukraine, the president was out every couple days telling Putin, don't do it. And now China is getting aggressive around Taiwan, and we're not hearing anything like that from the president. Oh, I beg to differ. We've been standing up here for almost a week, Peter, talking about uh, uh, our concerns about uh, what China was preparing to do. We put out uh, uh, declassified information that we saw what, what the Chinese playbook was going to be. Uh, look, I stood at another podium uh, a lot long ago, and much of the same way we, we uh, reacted then, we're reacting now in terms of being honest and transparent about what's going on and calling it out for what it is. Um, and then today, talking about exactly what we're going to do to make sure we can help preserve a free and open Indo-Pacific. So I'm, I'm afraid I just challenged the premise of your question. I know you said that there is not a, a <coughs> call scheduled with Xi. Is there a reason why? Because President Biden's known him for decades. Yeah. He's got a lot of free time up there in the residence this week. He doesn't have free time. He, he's, Is there a he's, reason he can't he's, just pick up the phone and he's call? He's been working all the way through his illness, quite frankly, Peter. So that's a little bit insulting. And um, as for it's a call, not insulting it is. To, to it say is. That, the, that someone who is isolating so by themselves. You suggested he has a lot of free time as if he's not doing anything. And you know that's not the case, Mr. Ducey. Now, look, as for a call with President Xi, I don't have anything on the president's schedule to speak to. If ever the president felt like a call with President Xi was the appropriate way to respond or that it would, uh, that it would have an effect and an outcome that he wants to achieve, he certainly would be willing to do that. He's talked to uh, Xi now five times. It's not like he's afraid to pick up the phone and, and call uh, President Xi. And if there's a, a, a if a call is the right answer, um, I'm sure that President Biden will do that. But I'm not going to get ahead of the president on this. I do want to stress. I said it before, but I I do think that your question begs me to say it again. That the lines of communication are still open with Beijing, and we're using those lines of communication. And I think you'll see that uh, in days to come as, as well. That's really important, and that's one of the reasons why. President Biden made that call a week or so ago was to make sure, and you saw it in Kareem's readout, to make sure that you know, those lines of communication stay open, and, and they are. Jeremy, and then I'll come to the back. Uh, John, you said a few moments ago that the president's been personally involved in Brittany Griner's case. Can, can you talk about what, what that has involved beyond getting daily updates on her situation and whether or not the president would be willing to speak directly with President Putin to negotiate her release and the release of the hallway? When I say personally involved, I mean he's, he's in uh, constant touch with uh, all the members of his team that are working on Brittany's case, and it's not just Secretary of State Blinken, Jake Sullivan, uh, the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs. Uh, uh, the Deputy Homeland Security Advisor, Josh Gelter. I mean, there's a lot of people involved in here, and him, he's driving a process of continual updates that he can get from his team. Um, he's offering guidance uh, to them as needed. Uh, you've seen that he has talked to Mrs. Greiner uh, herself, uh, and uh, certainly would expect that he's going to continue to have those kinds of conversations going forward. He's staying focused on this. And as for speaking with President Putin directly? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, again, I don't have, similar to, to the President Xi, I don't have any um, uh, calls to announce or speak to uh, with, uh, with President uh, Putin. The, the President is comfortable that the proposal that we put forward is a serious one. Uh, and he urges the Russians to accept that proposal so we can get Brittany and Paul home. And then you, you talked about the decision to make public that you had made an offer to the Russians. Uh, and you suggested that part of that was perhaps to put some pressure on the Russians because they hadn't been really all that responsive. Do you feel like making that offer public has changed anything? Has changed the status quo? Have you achieved the desired outcome of that, of that decision? Well, she's, she's not home. Neither is Paul. So uh, can, can we say that making it public had a direct line to bringing them home? Not yet, but we hope it will. We hope it will. We felt, we felt it was important um, to make sure the American people knew, uh, but as well as people around the world, uh, how seriously we're taking these two cases, uh, and that so seriously, in fact, that, that we had made a, a proposal that we believe the Russians ought to accept. And you'll notice that the day after we did that, the Russians started talking even publicly. So I'll leave it at that. And then on a separate issue, um, CNN reported today that the Department of Homeland Security is going to stop wiping mobile devices of high-level officials and political appointees um, without backing them up first. 
um, and is launching a 30-day review of policies. Is the White House directing any other agencies to take similar steps, including the Department of Defense, for example? I'm not aware of any other uh, instructions to other agencies. And then just lastly on, on Russia more broadly, um, can you speak at all to this newly declassified intelligence uh, that the Ru Russia is preparing to plant fabricated evidence uh, as it relates to this attack on, on the uh, yeah, I pr can actually. prison? Yeah. So I can share, based on downgraded intelligence, that we expect that Russian officials <coughs> are planning to falsify evidence in order to attribute the attack uh, on the Olenvika prison, Olenvika, sorry, prison, on the 29th of July, they're going to try to attribute that attack to the Ukrainian armed forces. We anticipate that Russian officials will try to frame the Ukrainian armed forces in anticipation of journalists and potential investigators visiting the site of the attack. In fact, we've already seen some spurious press reports to this effect where they have planted evidence. Uh, we have reason to believe that the uh, that Russia would go so far as to make it appear that Ukrainian HIMARS, the high mobility advanced rocket systems that have been so much in the news lately, were to blame uh, and to do that before journalists arrived on site. And again, we're beginning to even start to see some press reporting to that effect. Okay, way in the back, in the blue, way in the back. It's me. Thank you. Yes, thank you. You're not doing James. Yes, when you say that the US is preferred when you say that the U.S. is prepared to what, for what China will do, do you mean that you are prepared to engage militarily? I'm saying we are prepared uh, for what uh, China may do, and I think it probably wouldn't be a good idea to go into a great level of detail on that. Let me say that when I say we're prepared for what China may do, it's across all the tools. Um, of, of government power. It's not just about the military. Um, we have a robust military capability in the region. We have strong alliances and partnerships in, in the region. We also have economic throw weight, right? Um, and we have diplomatic throw weight. Um, there, there's a lot of things that the, that the United States can, can bring to bear uh, if we feel like we need to. But here's the thing. We shouldn't need to do it. And it shouldn't come to blows. There's no reason for this manufactured crisis to exist. The, the Chinese have used Speaker Pelosi's trip uh, as a pretext. Yes, they're claiming it's a protest. I got it. But it's also a pretext uh, to try to up the ante uh, intentions and to actually try to set a new status quo, to, to get to uh, a new normal uh, w where they think they can keep things at. Um, and my point in coming out here today was was to make it clear that we're not going to accept uh, a new status quo, uh, and that it's not just the United States, but the, the world will reject it as well. After the last talk between President Biden and Xi, there were indications that a meeting between, uh, between the two presidents may take place. There's, there was a room for that. Given the current situation, do you think there's a room for a meeting between the two presidents? Nobody's ruling out the possibility for a meeting between the two presidents. Phil, then Ed. Uh, there's reporting that the Biden administration is lobbying against legislation that would designate Taiwan as a major non-NATO ally. Can you tell us if that's accurate? And as we move towards what President Biden has often described as an era of autocracy versus democracy, um, should we be strengthening ties with Taiwan by entering into such a designation? I uh, think we're. Uh with respect to this proposed legislation, I, I think uh, we're going to avoid too much comment right now. Um, we certainly appreciate and respect uh, the, the role of Congress uh, and, frankly, the support uh, across the aisle uh, this year and so many years in the past for, uh, for support to, to Taiwan. Um, but I don't think it behooves us to try to get ahead of some proposed legislation before it, it, moves, uh, it moves further on down the, down the ways. I will only add that the Taiwan Relations Act, which is the law of the land, does provide the administration uh, a lot of vehicles and venues. And we get fixated on the, on the Taiwan Relations Act in terms of a security perspective and arms sales. And those, those have continued under this administration, and, and they will continue under this administration. But if you read the act, there's an awful lot more to, to it than just, than just arms sales. And uh, we fully respect 
uh, that law of the land, will follow that law of the land. Uh, it does provide on its own uh, an awful lot of flexibility and authority for the administration to continue to support Taiwan, particularly in their self-defense, and, and we're going to keep adhering, adhering to it. Just a, a quick follow-up. You, you mentioned this briefly um, about the canceled uh, ICBM test. Can you speak more generally to the decision um, not to move in that direction to cancel that? Was that, that the president's decision? And, and I guess, can you put a little bit more meat sure. on the bones in terms sure. of sure. Sure. lasting sure. tensions right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's not canceled. Um, it's it's only been postponed, and, and it's uh, been postponed for a short period of time. I'm not going to. Uh, uh, Tell you what the date certain here is on the calendar, but there is a date certain, uh, and it's it's uh, it's just been postponed for uh, for uh, a short period of time. So it's still going to happen, and uh, because it's not being postponed for an exorbitant amount of time, it, it's not going to have, as I said, any effect on our nuclear readiness. Um, the 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 decision came uh, in light and in context of the tensions that we're seeing right now, and they're pretty escalated. I mean, it's temperature's pretty high. Um, and the president believed and the national security team believed um, that a strong, confident, capable nuclear power can afford to wait a couple of weeks for a test uh, to make it clear, not just in word but in deed, how serious we are when we say we have no interest in escalating the tensions. We don't think there should be a pretext for crisis or conflict. And we're not, as I said in my opening statement, we're not seeking one. And this decision to postpone for a short while is meant uh, to prove indeed what we're, what we're saying in words about how serious we are. It's the responsible thing to do. It's the strong, confident thing to do. Uh, and the president stands behind that. Just a couple more. Green. Ed, and thanks, so Green. Then. Yeah, thanks, Green. Thanks, Sean. Um, so, given the aggression that we're seeing from China around Taiwan, and the FBI director today saying that China is the um, biggest threat to the U.S., or the number one threat to the U.S. in the next 10 years, would the president then caution companies from expanding business or doing business in China? We have been uh, nothing but transparent with uh, uh, with uh, businesses about uh, private corporations about uh, our concerns. Uh, um, regarding operations in or with China. But they're private companies, and they make their own decisions, and we have to respect that. What about supply chains with the, with the activity going on around Taiwan? How is that affecting our supply chains, and will we have problems? I don't think we've seen any effects yet. I mean, we're only a few days into this. Um, so it's something we're watching and certainly concerned about. Um, but we've also, I would add, Thanks to COVID, uh, I mean, we've done a lot of work, particularly in the last 18 months, to make more resilient uh, our supply chains across a range of sectors. Um, doesn't mean everything's fixed, doesn't mean it's perfect, but we've done a lot of work in that regard. So we'll just we'll watch and see how this goes. But there is a lot more resiliency in, in our supply chain capability now than there was, you know, a couple years ago. Can you clarify why your job is at the White House? Uh, thank you, Admirals. Over here, Sebastian. Um, I see. I'm looking right at you. Okay, okay. So there's a lot of people in blue jackets here. <laughs> yes. um, so uh, back back to Ukraine and the, uh, the deaths of those Ukrainian POWs. So the, the U.S. is coming under. You're, you're saying like a whole fabricated, you know, propaganda narrative is being spun. Um, is there anything that that uh, the administration will be able to point to, have people look at when they look at what? you know, the pictures that have been and so on that would tell you that that would not be a high mark. Is there any evidence that you're going to be able to bring? Well, let's see what they plant, right? I mean, let's see what they, let, let, let's see how they play this. And if they, we have evidence or uh, information that suggests that they're going to plant evidence to include maybe pieces of high mars. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what they do with it. I mean, I, I think, yes, I mean, uh, analysts would probably, depending on how big the piece is and you know, well, you'd be able to look at it and know whether it was, in fact, coming from the munitions that HIMARS fires. Is that what you? Yeah, I kind of meant starting from now, not 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 when whatever is going to be shown in journalists is shown. I mean, now, so far, is there anything that people could look at and say that doesn't look like a HIMARS impact, or, I, or yeah. is there anything the U.S. is going to be able to bring forth itself? I'm not aware of any imagery now that we have that will allow us to do that. But look, this is all fresh information. We'll see what they do with it, um, and. Uh, you know, it's a, 
it's uh, another common play out of the Russian playbook here to accuse others of what you did yourself. Um, and I'm not a criminologist, but I reckon you don't plan evidence unless you're trying to put the blame on somebody else. Just quickly on Iran, if I might, the nuclear talks uh, that have restarted. Would it be fair to describe this as a last-ditch effort? Uh, I'm sorry. The, the, the Iran nuclear talks that have restarted. A last-ditch effort? Yeah. Is, it, is it fair? Because, I mean, the, the, uh, Europeans, look, I, the Europeans are calling it like you know, a little bit of a last-chance saloon. I would tell you clearly, I mean, look, the negotiations are pretty much complete at this point. Um, and um, you heard the president say, uh, we're not going to wait forever for Iran to take this deal. It's a deal on the table. They ought to take it. Um, I, I, uh, I'm not going to slap a label on it and say last ditch, but clearly uh, time does appear to be getting very short in terms of being able to get to a deal. Um, and again, we urge Iran to, to take this deal on the table. No problem in the Middle East, none. It gets easier to solve with a nuclear armed Iran. Okay, we'll back. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, did the Senate, as well as President Zelensky, call on the administration to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism? Is President, President Biden willing to do it? The State Department is taking a look at the, at the possibilities um, around the potential designation. Um, they're still looking at that. I don't want to get ahead of their, their process. I would also add that a lot of the things that that designation uh, a lot of the authorities that come with it, I mean, a, a lot of them, a lot of the actions you can take were already taken. I mean, we, we have levied unprecedented sanctions against uh, Russia just unilaterally from the United States, let alone the rest of the world. And one more on China. You, you, you just a few minutes ago said that uh, China is trying to set a new stat status quo, a new normal. Could you elaborate on that? How do you see what they exactly want to achieve? By creating this crisis. Well, you've seen them. You've seen them uh, fly over the median line, you know, uh, on several occasions in just the last 24 hours. Uh, you've seen them now declare uh, naval operating areas, exercise areas, much closer to the island than they did 25 years ago. Um, you've seen them now fly as at least 11 ballistic missiles um, uh, in and around the Taiwan Strait. And uh, apparently, according to our Japanese allies, a couple of them, at least a couple of them, landed in their economic uh, exclusion zone, which means they most likely flew over the island. Um, you could see a scenario where they're just, they're just taking the temperature up, right? They're boiling the frog, right? They're, ta they're taking the temperature up to a higher level with perhaps the intention of maintaining that sort of intensity, or at least being able to conduct those kinds of operations uh, on a more frequent, regular basis going forward. Uh, that's, that's, that's a different status quo than the one that we had just a few days ago, just a week ago. Uh, and we're not going to... They may take a military action against Taiwan? Uh, I'm not going to speculate for what the Chinese may or may not do. Uh, uh, we're telling you what we're seeing, and we're telling you what we're expecting. Uh, we're expecting more exercises, uh, more bellicosity and rhetoric. Uh, uh, we're expecting uh, addi additional incursions, um, and, uh, and we'll see how this plays out. As I said, there's no reason for this to erupt into a crisis. There's no reason for this to come to blows, and nobody wants to see that happen. And I'll tell you this, having operated a little bit at sea myself, the, the, the more hardware you have, in close proximity like that, with tensions as high as they are, the higher risk you get of miscalculations and mistakes. And that is what could lead to something getting a, a, a lot more dangerous than it is right now. Okay, so it's not a crisis right Okay, but can you clarify what your White House is? You said that our can you clarify clarify China right? has been consistent. Your name is Simon, right? Yeah, I really want si to Simon? Ask you Simon? I'm Simon? I'm Simon? Trying to ask you this question. Simon. If, if you allow me to ask you this question. Sir, I'm Just gonna I'm gonna call on this man. Now, sir, listen now, I've been polite to you, but I expect a little bit of respect in return. You know you know where we are? This is the White House press briefing room, and you need to be more respectful. I'm going to call on this reporter. You described our policy toward China as consistent and clear, but the U.S. policy toward Taiwan is also described as strategic ambiguity. Don't you think it's sort of that ambiguity that has allowed tensions like we're seeing now to have developed? 
No, we would not agree with that at all. No. Okay, so on the subject of Americans detained abroad, the United Arab Emirates detained an American lawyer, a man named, uh, let's see here, uh, Asim Ghaffour. He is an attorney who's previously represented Jamal Khashoggi. Um, it happened shortly before the president's trip to Saudi Arabia. Is there anything you can say about the administration's efforts to free him or um, sort of any conversations? There, there's not a lot I can say about this particular case, sir. Uh, we're, we're certainly uh, aware, we're monitoring. Um, I'm referring to the State Department uh, to, to speak more on that. I'm afraid I just am not able to talk much about that particular individual in that particular case. Head of state Victor Orban is coming to the United States. He's going to speak at a conservative political conference in Dallas. Has the administration been in touch with Hungary at all over the trip? Is there any planned conversation that might happen? No and no. It's a private visit. Is the administration concerned at all with a sort of uh, an authoritarian leaning leader coming to the United States to pursue this? He's coming at a private in private invitation, um, and uh, Mr. Orban and uh, the CPAC they can talk about his his visit. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kovic, can you react to a letter that you received today uh, from a law firm in DC that the Saudi Arabia has been Okay. All right. We'll continue with that. Um, so we all, we all know how annoying it is when your flight is canceled or delayed, uh, and then it either takes forever to get your money back or you only get a flight credit for that airline. I'm sure many of you have gone through that last several months. Uh, today, the Department of Transportation issued a new rule to fix that. If your flight is canceled or delayed three hours for a domestic flight or six hours for an international flight, you must get a refund within seven days of a refund request if you paid by credit card. That refund policy also applies if they change your arrival airport, if they add more stops, or if they downgrade the class you're flying in. The rule also has new protections if you can't fly due to a pandemic or medical advice under the DOT's proposal. When that happens, you're entitled uh, to a non-expiring travel credit or voucher or a refund if it's an airline that got government assistance during the relevant public health emergency. With that, Josh, you want to kick us off? Yes. Thanks, Corrine. Yes. Um, tomorrow is Jobs Day, which is like Super Bowl for some of us. Friday's is it morning. really? <laughs> Look, there are a lot of nerds. Wow. <laughs> and I don't follow the Super I don't follow football, but wow. I mean, I'm just That's... saying, it, it, 12 Super Bowls a year is great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds exhausting. The report is expected to show that job gains last month slowed the 250,000 from 372,000 in June. Does the administration view this as a sign the economy is healthy? So as we've been saying for many months now, we are in a, um, and the president, including the president, has been saying that we are in a transition to a stable uh, and steady growth. And during that transition, what you'll see is instead of that record high uh, breaking number, job numbers that we've been seeing every month in the realm of 500,000 to 600,000 jobs on average per month, uh, we're expecting uh, at, at to be closer to uh, 150,000 jobs per month. And so that would actually uh, sign, that will be a sign of, uh, of a success of, of this transition. And this kind of job growth is consistent with the lower, uh, the low unemployment uh, numbers that we've been seeing, that rate of 3.6%. And we see that, and others have seen that, see that as a healthy economy. Well, we'll jump around. Just quick one, one quick one. <laughs> I don't know. With every, Usually this goes on for a while. I, I just have the one left. Based on everything that's happening mm. uh, in Asia right now, does President Biden consider China to be an opponent or a competitor? Look, and Kirby said this, and we've been saying this for the past couple of days, right? More than a week. Um, and. And I'm going to answer it this way because this goes to why this has come up, which is uh, the speaker going to Taiwan. Um, it, you know, she has the right to go to Taiwan. She has the right to travel wherever she wants. Uh, she is the speaker of the house. She is a member of Congress. We can, we will not ever tell her where to go. And we've been really clear with with China. We've we have said, the, no policy changes at all. 
the One China policy stands. Uh, and, and the President, just a week ago today, spoke to President Xi. It was the fifth time that they spoke. They have a continue to have an open, uh, an open dialogue. Uh, and so that is, I, I just want to make that really clear uh, and just, you know, they're, they're the ones escalating here. Just the relationship moving forward, though, would he consider China a competitor or an opponent of the United States? I mean, look, when we, when you think about, um, when you think about our economy, when you think about uh, uh, how we're competing around the world, around the globe, you think about the CHIPS Act, right, and the CHIPS and Science Act. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we talked about making sure that that got done in a bipartisan way, we saw that happen uh, just a couple days ago, is we want to be able to compete, right? We want to be able to compete with China. Uh, and we want to be able to have those manufacturing jobs investment in, uh, in the United States and also strengthen our supply chain, make sure we strengthen our national security. So, you know, as, as it relates to that in that, in that, um, in that realm, uh, you know, yeah, we want to be competitive as a country. Okay. Thanks, Frank. When was the last time President Biden spoke with Senator Sinema? Uh, don't have a call to read out to you at this time. Can you tell us how he views his role in getting the Inflation Reduction Act over the finish line? I know you've been asked some version of this question probably every day this week. <laughs> Trying to take another stab at it, though. Um, what does he think he needs to do? Is he going to be picking up the phone? Will he be inviting Senator Sinema here? What, how does he view his role? Well, I, I can tell you how he v views this anti-inflation uh, piece of legislation. He's grateful for it. Uh, he thinks it should be passed. Uh, he thinks it's going to change the lives of middle class Americans across the country. When you think about the prescription drugs, when you think about lowering utility costs, this is going to be critical. When you think even about the ACA provisions, lowering a health care cost as we talk about premiums and how important that is to many Americans. So that's how he sees his role in continuing to talk about it. We have been talking about these pieces, these components of this legislation for some time now. And so he's going to continue to have conversations. Our, our team is going to continue to have conversations with members of Congress. And, but he's been very clear. He wants to see this pass and, and to his desk so he can given, sign. Given how important he believes it is, as you just laid out, he took a decidedly step back and let Senator Schumer and Manchin really be in the two engaged in the negotiations to get uh, the Inflation Reduction Act to this point. So I guess the question is, does he feel like he wants to have a more direct engagement in these final round of negotiations with Senator Sinema yeah. asking for changes? So what we've been pretty clear about, I think for about a year, actually probably since the beginning of this year, is that we were not going to negotiate in public. Uh, we believed uh, that uh, the Senate, the House, they need to do their work. Uh, they, we let them speak uh, to the pieces of legislation that they're putting for, forth and they're trying to move forward. We support this. We support the work. Uh, that uh, that uh, Senator Schumer and Senator uh, Manchin are doing. Again, this is incredibly important uh, to, to the American people. I think, though, what is important, I know there's always this focus on Democrats and on what's happening with members, Democratic members in the Senate. I think what's important here is when you look at this bill, when you look at this, uh, uh, this anti-inflation uh, piece of legislation, and you look at the support across the country, it is bipartisan. It is bipartisan support. There was the Politico Morning Council poll that came out yesterday. More, so more than 70 percent of, uh, of um, support for many components of that bill. And it's Republicans in Congress who are opposing this. They're the only ones who are opposing this. And I think that's what matters. It, what matters to us is what Democrats are trying to do and how we're trying to change the lives of the middle just, class. Just very quickly, Senator Sinema is not yet supporting it. And based on our reporting, she um, is opposed to closing the carried interest tax loophole. Would the president support a final piece of legislation that did not include that? Look, what we, and I, I can't speak for Senator Sinema, I'm not going to. Uh, she can speak for herself. Uh, I know that uh, she's more than capable of doing that. What I can do is speak for uh, this president and how he sees uh, this piece of legislation that is so critical and important. And when you think about the corporate uh, uh, tax component, that 15 percent, you have corporations who are paying zero dollars, zero dollars. And this is an opportunity for to close that loophole. Uh, we've heard from many experts uh, talk about how uh, you know that that 15% uh, on corporate uh, corporate uh, 
corporate businesses uh, is going to make a difference. Uh, it's going to be able to add, bring, uh, add that $300 billion uh, so that we can bring down the deficit. It's going to be able to have um, uh, Americans have lower costs. And so that's what we see and we think, and we have been very clear on that, uh, how important it is to have to close that loophole and make sure that we're not increasing taxes on uh, middle-class Americans uh, that are making less than 400000 And that does this. This act does that. Uh, we, we've seen big oil companies um, report huge profits yet again in recent days. Um, but since gas prices have started falling, we haven't seen the same level of criticism from this administration. Are, is, is profit taking in that industry and a lack of investment in production still a big issue for so, the Biden administration? So can you say that one more time? Sure. Uh, uh, we've seen big oil companies take big profits, make yeah. big profits in, in the recent days. Uh, we haven't heard the same level of criticism from this administration um, since gas prices started falling. And just wondering if that is still, a, is still an issue for the Biden administration? Are, are you still looking to curb profit taking and, and increase production? So we've been very clear about, um, about that piece, making sure that the oil companies, what the, the profit that they're making actually goes, uh, goes, goes to the American people. The Ameri we say this all the time. The American uh, people should not be the first one uh, to pay the increased costs and the last ones to see the benefit. And we all continue to call on oil companies to make sure that they pass on uh, that profit to uh, to Americans. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, we had that the Department of Energy uh, had uh, that meeting uh, with oil companies and it was very constructive uh, the conversation with oil companies and we we welcome the steps that they are taking to increase production. Uh, for example, just want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, after discussions with the Department of Energy, one company just last week announced that they are bringing back refinery ref refining capacity at a New Jersey facility, so that is important. Uh, and in June, America produced an, on average 12 million barrels of oil a day, and that number continues to increase and is on track to reach high, uh, high, record high. So all of these things are important as we're trying to bring prices down. Oil is down about $25 a barrel from June. Gas prices have gone down every day this summer and are now below $4 uh, uh, for most of the country. So that uh, indeed matters. Uh, and so we're going to continue to do the work. We know that we have to give uh, Americans, as you hear the president say, a little bit of breathing room, and we're going to continue to do that work to make sure that happens. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, does the president have any plans to uh, intervene or fire um, the inspector general of the Department of Homeland Security, Joseph Kipari? No. Uh, we asked uh, your predecessor, Jen, talking about this in um, in April, when um, the leadership of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senators Durbin and Grassley, expressed concerns about him. Obviously, this was before some of the, the concerns that have been raised in recent days about January 6th. Um, and she said that she would follow up on that. I'm wondering, have there been any conversations in the White House about there's no, his leadership? There's no personnel. Um, uh, updates that I have for you at this time. Look, the president has been very clear, I think I answered some of this yesterday, that he believes in the independent role of the inspector generals and that they serve an important function in ensuring accountability for the American people. That still stands. He believes that. Uh, so, you know, again, we've seen the reports as you're, as you're laying out uh, and, and the comments from members of Congress, as you told, just told me, expressing concerns with his performance. But again, we believe in the independent role and I don't have any Right. And news for up on that, you said that the job of the inspector general is, as you just outlined, does the president have confidence that given what has uh, unfolded in the past few days and weeks, he how does he still have confidence in his ability to do that important job for yourself? Well, it's important to do the job that the inspector general is doing. We have confidence in that. Uh, and uh, again, we're, we're not going to comment any more, any further than that, but we have seen the reports. And just one more that I want to follow up on that I asked earlier this week about the president's own COVID protocols. Um, as soon as he uh, tests negative, is he fully free from isolation? Or is there, I know other White House staffers have been um, required to test negative twice before returning to work. What are the protocols for So the basically for isolation, uh, you know, today is day five uh, of the rebound because this is not, this is a, a rebound, not the, the the first, the first, I don't want to say bout because this is a continuation. It's just a rebound, and so he'll re will remain. Uh, he will re remain isolated until he tests negative, uh, as we previously stated. And so the 
when when we're doing that test uh, to uh, make sure that he's negative, that is above and beyond, as you kind of I think we're alluding to. That's that's what the White House protocol is uh, for us, and so he we won't see him again until uh, at least uh, in person. You have, guys have seen him virtually, and he's been working uh, from the White House residence uh, these past couple of days uh, until he has at least in person until he has that negative test. So just one day, the first time he tests negative, he will be. Well, the last time we shared uh, because of his unique role, right? He is the president, and we've tried to make sure that. Uh, we protect all of you and we protect the staff. Uh, we did do a, a, a two, two tests and make sure they were both negative. Green, can I follow up on, on Tyler's question, please? Thanks, Green. Um, on the issue of the Chinese tariffs, the president has been waiting for some time whether or not to ease some of those tariffs. And just given the aggressive action we've seen out of China since Speaker Pelosi's visit, I want, I'm wondering, will that factor into this decision on the tariffs at all, or does the White House see those as two separate issues? I I'm not going to go into any uh, uh, detail of the thinking of how we're moving forward uh, with, the chi with the China tariffs. Uh, I know it's been on, on the questions of, on the minds of all of you, a question that's been out there. Uh, the president is taking this decision very seriously, and once we have it, once we, uh, once he makes his uh, decision, we will share that with all of you. Uh, thanks, Green. Just to put a finer point on, on Tyler's question, uh, so it, will it be two negative tests this time or just one? Well, yes, it'll. It, we I, we put out a pool note that said just that, I believe, on Saturday. I don't think you guys said clearly whether it was two negative tests like he did the first time or if one will be sufficient. Well, what we're going to do, there's five days of isolation. This is the fifth day. We will have a negative test. Uh, it is, you know, it is up to his doctor uh, to decide, uh, you know, uh, if there will be a second one. What, what we did last time, what I can speak to, and we share that, the, 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 his uh, personal physician shared this, that they did two negative tests uh, because of the unique role uh, that he has, and that is something that his doctor uh, decided. Okay. And, and then on, on monkeypox, um, we learned in the last 24 hours that the Department of Health and Human Services failed uh, to ask that the bulk of the stocks of, of the vaccine uh, that it already owned be bottled for distribution uh, quickly enough. And does the president feel like his administration and the Department of Health and Human Services in particular has acted with enough urgency to confront this monkeypox? So I want us to take a step back on this because this is really important. Uh, and I know that uh, many folks have questions about this. And we are going to do everything that we can. Uh, to end this outbreak. That is our commitment, uh, and that's what we're going to uh, make sure uh, that we do that. So, as you all know, the monkeypox outbreak has evolved rapidly and uniquely from prior outbreaks. So we are in a different, uh, it's a different dynamic than it was uh, the last couple times because monkeypox has been uh, here in this country before. And so we have aggressively responded uh, at different stages of this outbreak. Uh, and so just wanted to give you a little bit of that context because it's spreading in, in, at different phases here. Uh, so. First, within two days of the first conf confirmed case of monkeypox in the U.S., we began deploying vaccine to states and jurisdictions and pre-positioning tens of thousands of additional doses in the strategic national stockpile. The initial science led us to believe, and this I think will answer your question a little bit, uh, based on recent past monkey monkeypox outbreaks, that those doses would be sufficient to meet the needs of the country, as what we knew at that time, because it's dynamic, it's changing. And so, but however, infectious diseases are dynamic, as I just said, and unpredictable, uh, inherently unpredictable, uh, which is why as soon as we saw that, uh, this outbreak was different and transmitting much more rapidly, uh, we quickly moved to order tens of thousands uh, of more doses. So just to give you a little bit of the numbers that we have, we have made more than 1.1 million doses available and shipped more than 600,000 uh, doses. Those are currently uh, out there going into jurisdictions uh, to states. And so, and, and with more being delivered each day, we also have ordered 5.5 million additional doses, which are helping us get more doses out uh, sooner, knowing that more are on the way. Uh, so this is this is just part of the process, and what we have been following the science uh, and making sure that uh, we are, you know, we are rapidly. Uh, um, 
uh, reacting to this, and that's what we've been doing this past couple days. There is currently a mismatch between the number of doses that the government has in bulk, the number of doses that have been bottled and sent out to state and local authorities, and, and then the number of doses that are actually needed. Does the president feel like his administration has acted with enough urgency? I mean, what we're, what we're saying to you is that I laid out how dynamic and how rapidly changing uh, this virus has been. Uh, and I'm, and also, you know, we, we just had, they just held, HHS just held uh, a press conference and talked about this. That's why we kind of moved the briefing so you all can have a sense uh, to hear what, to hear directly from them. There was the 600,000 that they talked about. Uh, they went from co testing capacity from 6,000 to 80,000 a week. That matters as we're trying to make sure we deal with monkeypox. And uh, we're working hand in hand with local authorities uh, to get the resources they need. And so, and as you also know, uh, we took, they took an additional step, which is to announce a public health emergency declar declaration of monkeypox. And that's important because of what that's going to do is going to help accelerate the vaccine production and distribution. This includes new dosing strategies that have the potential uh, to increase the number of available doses by fivefold. So yes, the president has confidence uh, in HHS. And, uh, and let's not forget, we just brought on the monkeypox uh, coordinate coordinators, the response team, which is going to also make and a difference. On that, on that front, it does seem like this week you've named the monkeypox coordinator. You've now declared this public health emergency. It seems like the administration is shifting into a higher gear as it relates to responding to this outbreak. And I'm wondering, was there any new information that led to uh, these these steps and that higher gear response, um, because you know the WHO. It was nearly two weeks ago that they called this effectively a, well, a public. Health I think I, I think I answer that in the first uh, question that you asked, which is the dynamic of this uh, of, uh, of the virus has changed. It's spreading a lot more rapidly uh, than it had in previous times. And when we when we first uh, when the first two cases. Uh, came uh, uh, were we were known uh, by the CDC back in uh, uh, back in May. Uh, we we were meeting the moment at that time, uh, and so now it's again it's spread much more. It's spreading much more rapidly. Uh, it's the dynamic of it has changed. Uh, that tends to happen inherently with viruses, and so this is what we're doing right now uh, to make sure that uh, we are uh, responding to the needs of jurisdictions and states. The way back. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you uh, go back to the event earlier today? Jay, Mary Farah of GM was there uh, uh, talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. One of the debates currently among Democrats is the electric vehicle subsidy provision. One of the senators from Michigan has been objecting to that. Uh, can you say whether the president discussed the EV provisions in that at all with the participants in the call beyond the public media portion? So I haven't gotten a download from that call, and uh, we were busy doing many other things uh, uh, before coming out here, so I, I can't speak to that uh, specifically. Uh, Senator Klobuchar has uh, a big tech bill, the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, that looks like it's spilling to September. Senator Schumer looks like he's planning to bring it to the floor in September. Does White House have a view on that, on that bill coming to the floor for a vote in September? The anti-big tech bill, which would, or the big tech bill that would prevent those platforms from giving preference to their own products. Well. I mean, we're trying to deal with the, all the, the pieces of legislation we have. We, there's a lot going on. We're trying to deal with what we have in front of us. Um, I would have to. Uh, yes, yes, we we, uh, we we are aware of that. I, I would need to just talk to the Office of Ledge Affairs to get more specifics and details on, on where we are. Uh, on that, as you know, uh, reform in, in the tech uh, tech industry is something that's very important uh, to the to the president. We've talked about that many times in the past 18 months, uh, but I, I don't want to get too I don't want to get ahead of our team. Okay, uh, and finally, on the going back to the monkeypox issue, do you have a sense of whether there will be a need for new funding from Congress for this? Yeah, I, again, I would I. We are. We have been asking for, as you know, uh, new funding, uh, additional, yeah, for the COVID response. Um, again, I would just have to uh, get in touch with our team. Uh, in some, at some point in the next couple of days or weeks, we will have uh, uh, the monkeypox coordinators here in front of you, and you all can can uh, get to know him and, and both of them and ask your questions. Okay. 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 Secret Service. That's great. Um, oh, I will. Oh, yeah, and I'll, I'll come to you after. After you. Cool. I just you. haven't. I. I don't see you very often. I see you all the time. <laughs>
Just to follow up on the monkeypox updates, California, Illinois, New York have all declared uh, states of emergency each. But due to the fact that most of them will be, uh, how will declaring monkeypox as a public health emergency affect colleges and universities in those states particularly that have already declared a state of emergency? How the states for for them? So I, you would have to uh, that you would have to talk to the states directly on about on that piece uh, because that's their own state emergency, public emergency. Is there any plan from the White House or any um, guidelines that would possibly come down looking forward to uh, essentially explaining what the colleges and universities should do? Uh, we don't have anything for you at this time, but I would go to the state specifically. Uh, you talked about California, you talked about New York. Uh, having their own state of emergency. I'm sure they have plans as schools are opening back up and dorms are opening back up. I'm sure they have specific guidelines uh, to that that I cannot speak to from here. Yes. Yeah. There was a report yesterday that Kirsten Cinema, um, number one, she wants to nix the carried interest loophole, which is like a $14 billion revenue raiser, and also she wants $5 billion in drought resiliency funding. Uh, does the administration think we need a few more billion dollars for drought resiliency? Yes, would that be a good thing? I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak to uh, to what uh, what the senator is calling for, asking for. That's negotiations that are happening uh, in Congress. I'm just not going to speak to that from here. Can I get you to respond to the, the Peter Meyer situation. He's one of the ten Republicans who voted to impeach Trump. He went down on Tuesday night, um, but the DCCC and other other groups were going hard to boost his pro-Trump opponent. Does the president have a view of playing ball in primaries like that in a way that helps? Trumpists. So because of the Hatch Act, I cannot speak to any uh, political campaigns or elections, midterms including, and so I, I just can't speak to that at this time. Can you talk about the old-fashioned old days when you could, you know, hang out with No, uh, we don't do the old-fashioned days. <laughs> we do it the right way. Yeah, I'm just going to take it. Um, can you walk us through the president's involvement and engagement on the monkeypox outbreak? When was the first time he was briefed on this? How he's getting updates on case numbers? testing capacity, vaccine supply and distribution. How much is he getting updated on this The right president now? is regularly briefed on monkeypox. This is something that um, is, uh, is top of mind as well for him. Uh, and so I can assure you that he is regularly briefed by his senior teams, um, also by uh, Secretary Becerra. Um, I don't have a, a list of how many times he's been briefed, uh, but he's very aware, uh, clearly, of, uh, of what's happening. And he actually uh, is, 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 um, you know, is, is constantly asking, what are we doing? How are we, uh, you know, how are we getting the vaccines out there? And, and is, uh, uh, is clearly interested in, in the specifics and making sure we get this under control. Can you talk about how this virus has been evolving? Uh, we heard today from the conference call about how this is spreading very quickly. One of the criticisms during the baby formula shortage was that the president acknowledged later that he didn't realize at the time how bad that was getting and that he wasn't, uh, he didn't know how quickly that had gotten bad. Uh, can you say now that the president was informed in a timely manner about how quickly this was spreading and how fast What I can going? tell you is that this is an urgent matter, uh, monkeypox, uh, for this administration, for this president. That's why you have seen the announcements that we have made in the past several weeks, not even just today or yesterday or the day before. Uh, last week we were announcing uh, vaccines, 800,000, and now uh, we're talking about how much have been shipped. Uh, now we we just announced the coordinators uh, for uh, that, that rapid response team. Again, this is um, uh, this is a virus, as we know, viruses inherently uh, uh, can be dynamic, and uh, and it is spreading rapidly. And we we acknowledge that uh, when we first when we first heard about the first couple of cases, uh, we met we believe we met that moment, uh, and now we are rapid thing rapiding uh, rapid things up and making and making sure that we are meeting uh, the moment across the country and what people need. That's why we have 80,000 capacity and testing. How important that is. We went from 6,000 to 80,000. That's why we now have 1.1 million uh, vaccines. Uh, the other thing I do want to say is that um, as we're accelerated delivering of, uh, of 150,000 Janos vaccine doses to the U.S., 
th these doses, which had been slated to arrive in November, is now going to be in, s in September. So again, we're we're, wrap we're we're taking this very seriously. We're taking we're accelerating uh, and strengthening the uh, and our comprehensive response uh, so that we can make sure uh, that we end this outbreak. And that is the mo number one uh, priority for the president. We'll be here tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. If you if you take a seat. I